when we started planning this conference, we had a, a short list of people that we really wanted to get here. Um, somehow we got our entire list, and that's our entire list of speakers. But uh, one of the first names that we came up with was Dr. Donlito. I know that there are families in this room, um, mine included, who owe their children's lives and um, their children's chances at life to Dr. Donlito. Um, I told Nisha that I would not cry while I introduced him, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> my son is two and a half years out from the completion of a biventricular conversion um, under Del Nido's very skilled hands. He hiked 20 miles in three days the other week. Um, and so for our family, there's no, there's no real way to explain what this work has done. Um, when you see these kids running around, there's a few of them here who have, who this man knows what their hearts look like. Um, so Dr. Del Nido, we are very excited to hear from you. One thing that Dr. Del Nido said is that he would prefer that during the session, if you have questions, raise your hand, we'll get you a mic, and you can ask um, during, during his talk. It just, it makes more sense to ask while we're all thinking about whatever the topic is rather than waiting till the end. So we'll have a mic, um, so if you have questions, I mean, within reason. I know we all have a lot of questions in this room. <laughs> Let's try and let him get through his uh, material, but definitely if you do have questions while he's speaking, raise a hand and we'll get you a mic. Dr. Del Nido. Thank you, Ali. Um, first of all, it's just, uh, it's, it's quite amazing to see, um, you know, this group to come together. Uh, I think the last time uh, we were uh, together was about three years ago, something like that. And um, the group has grown. The, uh, I think the level of activity has certainly increased, um, and the awareness of this particular problem has uh, continued to expand. So when Ali contacted me about this, um, I said, I'm, I'm happy to come. Um, I can talk about a whole bunch of things about what we do. A lot of them could be very, very technical, but I'd like to maybe just talk a little bit about how we think about uh, heterotaxy syndrome uh, now, how we used to think about heterotaxy syndrome, what's changed, um, and where do we think we're going to go with this, uh, with this particular set of problems. So this dates back to my training. Um, when I did my uh, cardiothoracic training in pediatrics, this was at, in Toronto, the Hospital for Sick Children, um, when we had a disease to deal with, uh, we would categorize it, we'd look at the results, and then we would say, well, this group over here, these are the heterotaxis, so we're going to leave them out because they're different and they don't do as well. So we always study the ones that we could do well with, and then the heterotaxy somehow were shifted to the side, and everybody said, well, yeah, but they're heterotaxy, and we know that they're more complex, and so we won't deal with them. And that's how I, uh, that's how I grew up in my training. Um, and over time, you begin to realize that, no, I mean, there are issues there, and they need to be addressed. And yes, the risks are higher, but the risks are higher mainly because we haven't really thought about the solutions properly, not because there's inherently something there that we can't fix. So once that mindset change occurred, um, then the rest was kind of hard work. The rest was just figuring out, okay, what are the solutions, what works, what doesn't work, and then how do we proceed? So I'll talk a little bit about that journey, but I also want to give you some background on, again, the things that uh, impact us in the cardiac world uh, about heterotaxy and how we, ha how we analyze them and how we have to think about it. Traditionally, heterotaxy has been a descriptive term. In other words, people say, okay, these kids have funny-sidedness. You know, they either have a both, both sides of their body is left-sided or it's both sides of their body is right-sided, and their organs are in that orientation. And, and that's a description. We call it the morphology. Um, and it's accurate, 
Uh, and in fact, we can catalog them according to percentages and so forth. Um, but from a functional standpoint, from what we have to do, it makes very little difference. It doesn't really matter to me that one lung has three lobes uh, versus two lobes. Uh, but what it does matter is does that lung function and does it function well? Uh, and how is that going to impact us if we're doing a big open heart procedure? How is it going to make a difference as far as the risk of that procedure? So it's important to make that switch because you, you, we tend to be focused on the things that we can easily catalog, such as how many, how many lobes there are to the lung, but we don't necessarily focus on the things that really matter is how well is it working. That made a huge difference to us when we started to think about it in those terms. The same thing I think is true about the genetics. We know that there are, I and mean, we've heard a, a, an amazing talk on the genetics of heterotaxy. It's obviously a very, very complex problem, but that's because all of genetics is complex. There isn't a single gene that gives you a disease. It's very rare, very, very rare to have a disease that's only a single gene. Almost all the diseases we have are multiple, hundreds of genes, all interacting. So it's a very complicated problem, and these are, this is just a small list um, and Dr. Ware actually gave you a much better list of what are the genes that have been documented as being involved. The problem here is that we don't know exactly what each gene does in the contribution to the disease process. And we don't know um, what percentage impact it has. But it's a beginning. At least it's, it, it's, it's in the morphology stage. I think as individuals like Dr. Ware continue to do research and understand the functional impact of those genes, then we're going to really understand how this all comes together. I think the technology is actually now beginning to come together. Where, you know, if they, when the days when I trained, if you found one gene, that was a lifetime's work. <coughs> Today they're dealing with 20,000 genes at one time, so it gives you an idea how fast that field is, is moving. So in another 10 years, we're going to be much, much more understanding of how this works. But uh, right now, all we can do is we can say, well, this is the descriptive part, this is what we know is involved, and that's really about all we can say. Now, beyond the genetics, we know that there are syndromes, and by syndromes, we're talking uh, really to trying to describe something where there's a series of defects, actual functional defects, that make a difference, that actually have an impact. And primary ciliary dyskinesia is probably one of the more important ones in heterotaxy. Why? Because it really impacts a whole host of things. It does primarily, and here I'm talking about the cilia that actually wiggle around and move, move fluid, not the cilia that sense, which is maybe part of the cause of heterotaxy. But this is a different cilia. These are the ones that actually sit in your airway, for example, in the cells, in the lining cells of your airway, move the mucus out continuously so that any bacteria that get in there get washed out very quickly. Um, when they don't work, they're discoordinated, then the mucus sits there, the bacteria can grow, and, they, and the kids are very susceptible to infections. It's only 12% of heterotaxies that have this primary ciliary dyskinesia. So even though we talk about it a lot and we hear about it a lot, very, it's a small percentage of kids who really have this full-blown syndrome. Whether other kids have a milder variant, it's hard to know. But nevertheless, it's important for us to be aware of it. Um, and, and the main reason is because it, this is all about prevention. Once you get the infection, you're in trouble. This is about preventing. So chest physiotherapy, helping them clear secretions, giving them aerosolized treatments to clear the secretions is what we have to do. Antibiotic use, prophylactic antibiotic use. Again, that's, it's, it's an anathema in medicine to treat prophylactically with antibiotics for, this, for the simple reason that people say, well, you're going to select out these horrible resistant bugs. True, if we use them across the entire population. But if you have a group that's susceptible, they definitely need this. So heterotaxy patients uh, in particular, because of this type of problem, it's in the minority, but they have it, and also the kids that have absence of a spleen, which I'll talk about in a minute, they're more susceptible. So. We need to preempt the problem. When we preempt the problem, yes, we're going to treat kids that may not need it, but on the other hand, if we can prevent the disastrous problem in the ones that do, it's worth it. So that's been our, our approach, and that's been a, a mindset change uh, in how we manage. I'm going to go through the different organs that are impacted, um, and just to talk about 
what what we see in heterotaxy and whether it really makes a difference as far as how we think about the cardiac issues. I talked a little bit about how the lung can be very different. It, you can have bilateral uh, uh, lungs that are, that are exactly mirror images of each other. Um, in the normal lung, the right lung and the left lung are different. The one has three lobes, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. Um, but functionally, it makes no difference. Uh, they both work well, and they both work the same. You could remove an entire lung in someone who's otherwise healthy, and they do fine. Okay? They're not going to run a marathon, but they'll be fine. On the other hand, um, if there is a disease process in those lungs, then that's a different story. So other than the morphology, other than looking different, it makes no difference that kids have three lobes or two lobes on both sides. The spleen, on the other hand, is quite different. The spleen uh, um, presence or absence of a functional spleen is quite different. The spleen is involved in the development of a lot of the immunologic system in your body, a lot of the innate defenses against viruses, against certain types of bacteria are involved in the spleen. And in kids who have um, a, a absence of the spleen or absence of a functional spleen, uh, they're more susceptible. And they're more susceptible to particularly overwhelming infections that can be really quite, uh, uh, quite serious. So we look at that. We pay a lot of attention to that. And I'll show you some statistics as to why we pay attention to it. About 53% of the kids with heterotaxy have absence of a spleen or at least a functional spleen. So it's a large, large percentage. So it's something we cannot ignore. Uh, and even the kids who have polysplenia, uh, sometimes if they have multiple very small spleens, those uh, don't necessarily function well. So what do we do to look at the functionality of the spleen? We look at these things called Howell Jolly bodies, which is a, 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 um, a way of examining uh, blood cells in order to detect uh, components in them that show signs that they're not really functioning well. Uh, it's a very straightforward thing to do, and we definitely uh, do do that in kids. Yeah. Um, one of the things in our community is oftentimes those are tested really early in age. How does this prevent headaches? Yeah. Do you have any classes where, where it's like Sorry. Oftentimes that question comes up in our community, and these young infants will be tested and our understanding is that's too early what's the recommended age oh boy. where that's i was accurate. hoping you weren't going to ask that question <laughs> it's it's a big one I, I'm, a, I'm a surgeon okay i'm a simple guy i don't okay. i don't really know hematology <laughs> <laughs> so i think it's probably better off to ask that of a hematologist uh, about that um, in general though if you if we do find that uh, when you have the presence of these Howell Jolly bodies, that's usually been pretty pathognomonic of the fact that you don't have a functional spleen. Generally what we do is we just do an ultrasound or some sort of a scan uh, to detect the presence of the, skin, uh, uh, the spleen. And, and if there is a spleen that's present, then you're, you're, you're probably fine, okay? If you don't have a spleen that's present, you wanna detect, or at least multiple small spleens, uh, you wanna see if, they, if there's functionality of that spleen. Okay, and that's how generally how we have approached it. I think next time we may need to get a hematologist in here. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much. The risk that we're talking about here for this is uh, overwhelming infection. Um, and it's of certain types of bacteria. <coughs> so what, what the general recommendation is preventive antibiotics, so prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, is 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 a must uh, for kids, and and there's data there's data showing that in fact if you do take and it's typically it's amoxicillin or Bactrim these are straightforward, pretty simple you take it once a day. Um, there's data saying that it is effective in preventing some of these uh, some of these really serious overwhelming infections. So, in general, it's one of those things that again we pay a lot of attention to because we operate on kids. And uh, with uh, often who don't have spleens, uh, their, their immune system is suppressed as a consequence of what we do, of the surgery itself. And if you add that on top of their susceptibility, now we have the combination that could really cause a problem. So that's, that's why it, it, for us it's, it's actually one of the probably more important things that we look at um, um, in, when considering surgery on, on kids with heterotaxy. Um, 
we do know that uh, visceral problems, abdominal organ problems, or, or abnormalities um, can be present. Sometimes these are functionally important. If the, if the liver is on one side of the body, or if it's a midline liver or on the other side of the body, again, as long as it's working fine, it makes no difference. On the other hand, uh, if the abdominal organs, the, the bowel, the, the, the gastrointestinal tract, is um, not in a, in a proper orientation, not in the proper rotation, then it is susceptible to volvulus. In other words, twisting on its own axis, cutting off its blood supply, and causing potentially a pretty disastrous uh, complication. Again, it's one of those things that is fairly common in heterotaxy. There's been some controversy as to what do you do about it. Um, and there's been a, l because it's a rare problem, and everybody has their own anecdotal experience, there's been a lot of, of, of reports uh, and centers who believe in doing something preventive for malrotation, and the centers that don't believe that the risk of the surgery outweighs the risk of developing the volvulus, and therefore they don't recommend prophylactic surgery. The most definitive article I could find, and again, this is an area that um, I haven't thought about bowel surgery since I did my general surgery training many, many years ago. But this actually, th uh, this review, which I think y you all have copies, uh, or at least of the reference, um, well, it's actually one of the best ones that I've seen, uh, where they actually looked at all of the publications uh, in this area, in this field, and kind of looked at uh, the numbers of patients. And, and overall, what they said was, in general, uh, everybody should be screened, all the kids who have this should be screened, and if they do have malrotation, then real consideration should be given to a preventive, to a LAD procedure, which is where they, they pin the bowel in the proper rotations to prevent this malrotation. It has to be done by individuals who know how to do it, because it's, it, again, it's a rare problem. And, and we all study it in medical school, but it's very different than doing it yourself. Uh, and so if you, if you do these on a regular basis in a large center, uh, it's one thing. If you w do one of these every five years, I'm not sure you're going to get the same results. And, 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 and this is the main message, and this was a, a, a review article that came from the group in Toronto, um, which in my view summarizes it the best. You know, they really looked at it and they said, um, if, you have, uh, you know, if you have malrotation, serious consideration ought to be given. And it's usually a problem in the early years but it is potentially a catastrophic problem if the volvulus occurs and, uh, and it's not caught early enough. A number of years back, um, 2014, uh, Wayne Turetsky, who uh, some of you may know is a pediatric cardiologist in our team who um, specializes in fetal cardiology, did a very interesting study. He, 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 he did something, he followed kids with a fetal diagnosis of heterotaxy and, and, and looked at their outcomes long term. And he kind of described something which we all inherently knew, which is there's a very big difference between having a functional spleen and not having a functional spleen. And so this is a study where, where over a period of about um, you know, almost 15 years, he collected um, fetal studies in 154 uh, fetuses who they diagnosed heterotaxy syndrome in utero and followed them out longitudinally. And, and what, he f what he described here is that, number one, at that time, in that time period, 95 to 2011, most of those kids were not getting bi-V bi -V therapy. Most of them were getting single ventricle therapy. And our interest was in really cataloging how we were doing with heterotaxy. But what he demonstrated is two things. Number one, we weren't doing well with the, the standard management. But more importantly, there's a very big difference in, in, in the presence of a spleen versus no presence of a spleen. And this is what this graph here shows, is that if you have spleens, mo either polysplenia or a functional spleen, your outcomes, yes, in the first few years of life, there's a risk, um, about 20% um, uh, mortality in that. In, but then after that, <laughs> it's relatively flat as compared to the kids who have absence of the spleen, where the risk continues in the first two, three, four, five years of life, and the curve continues to go down. Whether it's the presence or absence of the spleen, or whether that is simply a marker for many other 
complications or other associated problems, I think it's probably the latter. I think that the, the risk of dying of overwhelming sepsis while it is there is only one cause, but and the, the, the splenia or, or, or asplenia dichotomy is actually a very helpful marker in determining what other associated cardiac defects um, uh, you have. Kids who have asplenia have a certain percentage of certain types of problems um, versus the other group, and those problems can be very challenging to deal with on a cardiac basis. So Wayne um, did us a big favor. Number one is he, he pointed out to us that we weren't really doing well with this, with heterotaxy in general. But number two, that we needed to start thinking about these other factors which go into the risk. So going at the anatomic factors, um, the superior vena cava, we know that this is a, the venous return from the upper half of the body. Uh, normally um, you have one superior vena cava, it's on the right side, that's the dominant one. Early in fetal life you have two, one goes away and the other one remains, um, but often in heterotaxy you have two. So in asplenia, um, about 70% have bilateral uh, superior vena cava. In polysplenia, uh, 50%. So it's common, it's a very common uh, finding. Why does it have importance? Normally and physiologically it doesn't have much importance, but if you're dealing with considerations about single ventricle pathways, Glenn operations, Fontan operations, uh, it makes a difference. It makes a difference as far as timing, it makes a difference as far as the technical aspects of it. Dr. So, Del Nido. Yeah. Um, ironically, we ran into yesterday a father who has a son in the hospital right now that has bilateral superior vena cavas. How often does that occur outside of heterotaxy syndrome? Very rare. Very rare. That's kind of what we told him, but just <laughs> wanted to verify our information. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it can happen, but it's very rare. Okay. And in fact, for us, if we see, if we see a child with, uh, you know, in the fetal studies, that's one of the things that they look at, right. uh, other than also position of the liver and things of that, of that, of that type. But yeah, it's, it's, un, it's uncommon. Okay. You know, can it occur? Of course, anything can occur. But uh, the odds are that they have some variant of heterotaxy syndrome. Okay. All right, we will let him know. Thank you. <laughs> Pulmonary veins. Uh, this, is, this is the Achilles heel of, um, of cardiac surgery right now, although we're really making headway finally uh, in this disease. Anomalous pulmonary venous connection. So this is where the, the venous return from the lungs uh, gets back to the circulation somehow, but doesn't always uh, do it directly to the heart. It should come directly to the heart. Um, and in asplenia, about 60% or more uh, have abnormal, abnormal connections. So the pulmonary veins uh, do not connect directly to the heart. They connect via some other route and that leaves them susceptible to obstruction. It also means often we have to fix that early in life because if they're obstructed, that's not compatible with life. We have to fix it and often we find ourselves fixing it as a newborn, uh, which is a big risk factor because technically we're just not great at doing that operation in a newborn. If we can push it off even three months, the results are better. So it's important, um, this, is, and this in my view is one of the biggest single reasons why asplenia is a marker for higher risk, but primarily not because the absence of the spleen in and of itself is so much of a big deal, but because of the presence of this. Anomalous pulmonary veins, particularly with obstruction, is probably one of the single highest risk factors for heterotaxy. Um, so it's a, it's a reason why we started actually a pulmonary vein program because we said, you know, our results with pulmonary vein obstructions are horrible. Um, what we do now doesn't work. Let's figure out a better way to do it. And Chris Baird in our group um, has become the world expert in it, and his results are uh, nothing short of dramatic. Polysplenia, presence of a spleen, only 1% have total veins. So to me, this is, one of the, this is part of the dichotomy. If you have a splenia and you have a high chance you're going to have total veins, high chance you're going to have to have surgery on those total veins, and if we don't have a good technique for fixing those veins, you're going to have problems. So um, this is an important area. All right, before you go on to this next slide, we did have a question. Um, 
How frequently are there extra pulmonary veins that you see? It's not so much extra, but it's the connection. Um, you know, you can, you can vary the number of veins, and that's actually in the normal uh, heart. You, normally, we have four, you know, from the, uh, the right and left side upper, right and left side lower. But people can have three, where two from one side come together first and then enter the heart. Uh, you can have on the right side, you can have upper, middle, and lower low. You can have three directly joining and separately. Those are all normal variants, but they connect to the heart directly, unobstructed. That's what matters. If they do not, even if they come close, but never make a connection and then go somewhere else and connect, that's when we have a problem. Okay? So it's not so much the number, but it's where they connect. Want to comment? Yes. Yeah. Typically we say four, because that's the most common, but five is not uncommon. Um, and in, in kids who have two right lungs, they have three on one side, three on the other, so you could have six. So it's, it's you know, it's that, that, that's, but that in and of itself doesn't make it abnormal. That's just, it's one of those morphology things that, you know, people love to catalog, but it really makes no difference from the standpoint of, of prognosis, complications, outcomes, or anything else. But if those veins don't connect, totally different thing. Other problems, now we're working our way inside the heart, common AV valve. This is the inlet valve into the heart. In Normally we have a right and left valve, inlet valves. I have the tricuspid valve for the right side, the mitral valve for the left side. They look differently, they function differently, their support structure is very different. Kids who have heterotaxy syndrome have one large valve that straddles both sides. And that's, that's a, a, um, um, a very common feature. As you can see, in asplenia, it's 70%. Uh, less common in polysplenia. Again, uh, polysplenia having factors that, are, that are lowers the risk because now all of a sudden we don't have to deal with these large common AV valves which have a tendency to leak. Um, but in asplenia, a large number of the kids do. And those valves are much more susceptible to leaking particularly early in life. And so if I hear of a three-month-old who's got a leaky valve, to me, it's an asplenic child, common AV valve, and they have a lot of leak, okay? And those are one of the more challenging problems that we face. We still, uh, you know, we're working on good solutions for it, but we, 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 we still have um, a difficult time managing these problems. Again, this is the asplenia group. AV canal defect, now this is in the septum, in the wall between the two sides of the heart. Uh, having a hole is very common between the two sides in a particular place at the inlet, that's called a canal. Uh, so having a, a canal defect is again in asplenia, uh, 69 or 70 percent of the kids have it. Um, and in polysplenia, only a third of them have it. So you can see the differences, polysplenia and asplenia in the heart consistently, one, one issue after another is very different, okay, uh, between the two. Ventricular loop, this is, this is mostly how the ventricles connect, the upper chambers and the ventricles. Normally, a right atrium connects to a right ventricle, left atrium connects to a left ventricle, and they're very different. They look different, they, they, their structure is different, they're designed for different work. Inverting those so that the right atrium connects to an anatomic left ventricle is what looping is all about. Fortunately, um, um, most of the time, D loop is the normal, L loop is the abnormal. So here, we're only about a third of the kids have this abnormality on top of all these other issues. Uh, so fortunately, that's a relatively uncommon. Now, th does this matter a lot? Well, not a whole lot. As long as the ventricles work, it doesn't matter that how they're connected. We can figure out ways to reroute the blood to the proper ventricle. But it, it, the, the importance of it is that kids who have this, this misconnection, their, their rhythm um, is susceptible, their heart rhythm is susceptible because of that connection between the upper chamber and the ventricles. Because of that misconnection, that connection is, is, is electrical connection is, is very susceptible to failure. And so kids could need a pacemaker uh, as a consequence of that. Can we deal with it? Yes, pacemakers are you know, ubiquitous. They're fairly sophisticated nowadays. Uh, we can figure out how to, how to control their rhythm, but uh, obviously it adds another complicating factor here. Fortunately, it's, it's not as common. 
uh, it's, it's really only about a third of the kids who, who have that. Um, in, it's, in the issues of, of um, L looping, which is this, this misconnection, uh, is the one that's susceptible. The ventricles themselves, uh, whether they're good size or not, um, is interesting. Uh, most of the time, they're actually pretty normal size. And this was to me the one revelation that despite all of these other problems with valves, with holes, connections, veins, at the end of the day, most of the time, the two ventricles are normal size and they're working well. And if we have that, we figured that we could probably get kids to two ventricle repair. And so that was the, the one final uh, sort of uh, coin that dropped, at least in our thinking, was that no, we, we had already started a biventricular recruitment program for a different disease, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, with, where kids are born with a very small left-sided structure to their heart, no other abnormalities, tried to recruit, um, and get those ventricles to grow by fetal surgery, by postnatal surgery, and we were successful in about 40%, but um, not very successful in the other 60. But the techniques that we developed for that were much more applicable to the heterotaxy. So the heterotaxy group actually benefited from the knowledge that we gained from that other group because they, we started off with two good ventricles and we knew we could fix everything else and that was the final revelation. So this was the good news. So far I've only given you the bad news. <laughs> so this is the good news. Um, and so the incidence of, of um, uh, hypoplasia is, is relatively low. Ventricular arterial connections often, this is the connection between the ventricles and the outflow arteries. Very frequently, 80%, um, there's abnormalities. But again, in today's world, we have techniques. We have surgical techniques for fixing that, for dealing with these problems. It's not a complicated issue. 20 years ago, it was, it, we were still developing the techniques for doing it. Now it's pretty standard. And, 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 it's, and it's really not, not a, a, a significant consideration. Yes, we have to deal with it, but it, it doesn't impact us very much. But you still see again that in asplenia, 80% of the kids have those abnormalities. In polysplenia, 37%. Again, the difference is between those two. So, you know, I showed you some data um, earlier from Wayne Turetsky looking at fetal uh, um, diagnosis of heterotaxy, how do they do long term? This is um, um, a large series that was done looking at what are the results if we do uh, in heterotaxy kids uh, when we're able to um, do two ventricle repair, which was in the mi very minority. This was before uh, we did any real conversions, but kids who had mostly two ventricles and we could. And, and, and you can go directly to a two ventricle repair versus those kids that ended up with a single ventricle. Um, and what we found in this, in this study, uh, this was published in 2013, again a large series, this came out of Korea, was that yes, even the biventricular kids who, who could have a biventricular repair right from the beginning, um, they still had a higher risk, about a 10% risk, but it was dramatically different than the kids who had single ventricles, where at least in their experience, when you get out, you know, 10, 12 years, um, in their experience, really only about 30% of those kids were still alive with a single ventricle management. And this was not a whole lot different than the results that we were seeing. The, we, we were seeing similar results and nobody was reporting them. They were simply, if you looked at uh, typical single ventricle Fontan series, there were large centers reporting 100, 200, 300 cases long term. They would describe everything and they would exclude heterotaxy because they would say, well, those are high risk. And so then nobody reported those. The Korean group reported their results and everybody said, oh, that's terrible. But yeah, but everybody has those results. And that, again, was one of the drivers for saying, well, if this is terrible, why do we persist doing it? Why do we continue to, to pursue a single ventricle management? Um, and at that point, we said, you know, th this really needs to change. And we had learned already a lot, as I mentioned before, about how to recruit ventricles, how to deal with valves that were not functioning well, um, how to deal with connections between the ventricles and the aorta that were not, uh, up, you know, that, that were not well connected. Um, but we, what we hadn't done is put it together as a program. 
And in, in 2014, Ram Amani in our group uh, uh, accepted the challenge, uh, which is great <laughs> because it was a huge challenge. But what he needed to do was bring together all the individuals that have various and sundry expertise in the cardiac space uh, to, to address the problems of heterotaxy and come up with sort of standard operating procedures, if you will. How do we manage kids with this particular set of problems and the wide variability we see, how do we manage them so that we avoid the pitfalls, so we come up with better, um, you know, with, with better outcomes. So he took that on. Um, they had a mission. Uh, his mission was to discuss every child that had some sort of a borderline heart that wasn't considered amenable to biventricular repair and, see, and that was treated at, at, uh, at our center and see if we could figure out ways to get them to two ventricles. That was, that was basically it. And, and this included obviously heterotaxy, but it included all kinds of other kids, including hypoplastic left heart syndrome, other kids with very complex anatomy that typically surgeons didn't want to deal with, instead they would do a Fontan. Um, and then they wanted to track their outcomes, which, you know, for surgeons, this is a, 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 a mindset change. If we get out of the operating room, the operation looks good, we call it a success. Uh, if the child is doing well a year or two later, well, you know, okay, that wasn't our issue. We needed to change that. We needed to understand that what we did in the operating room had an impact a year, two years, three years, five years down the road. And so if we knew what the impact was, maybe we could change what we did in the operating room. So that was the other component of this, of this program, which was to, in my view was probably one of the more critical ones. We could report a series 30-day survival of heterotaxy patients having had a Fontan operation, and the results would look great. We would have 95 plus percent survival, the results would look great, but if we looked at that group a year later, totally different. And so when we started to look at them a year, two years, five years later, that's when the reality hit, and we said, this isn't working. So to me, it was critical that we looked at the results long term. And then obviously develop guidelines, develop protocols, develop things that we could actually study um, and, uh, and analyze. Um, and then the other component which uh, we were for lucky enough uh, to, to really recruit was te technology experts. Heterotaxy, intercardiac heterotaxy um, problems are things that are very complex from a geometry standpoint. It's three-dimensional geometry that's very, very complicated. And all our imaging studies are two-dimensional. So they give us either projection views of what's going on or a single cut plane of what's going on and then the cardiologist or the surgeon in the operating room now when they have this three-dimensional heart in front of them, they have to figure out, okay, I saw this in 2D, now I have to put it all together and create a 3D picture in my head and figure out what to do. That's really hard and, and particularly if you only see these things you know, once in a while, you just don't gain any expertise. So the visualization technology though has exploded and it's exploded primarily thanks to all the kids who are doing games on their computers who want to do things in 3D and this is true. We would never have advanced to 3D imaging un unless there was a huge, huge, huge market for 3D visualization. And in the, in the gaming world, that's the key. If you can see things in real 3D, then you know, people get excited. Well, for us, that was a huge opportunity. And so we recruited engineers uh, and computer scientists to work with us and develop these tools. And that actually has made a huge difference because now you can actually understand the problem before you ever get into the operating room. And, and, and our next step is actually to develop a way to practice the procedure before you ever get into the operating room. And which is, you know, it, it's actually, I mean, it's a total sea change in thinking uh, in surgery, but I think that's where we gotta go. So the technology, I would say, is, uh, you know, has been a critical aspect of where the advances have come in. Because then we could, it, it, it's not just the one individual who's got the experience and everybody else comes and watches. It's now you could disseminate the technology and train a whole, a whole series of people in doing it. They can all understand it and then they can do it. So that was the, that was a key. So 
that to me was also important. Um, and then regular meetings. Every Tuesday from 4 to 5, they spend an hour looking at every single case. And it's an open forum. Everyone can bring a case that they want to talk about and, and decisions about um, management and so forth uh, is, is done in that group. We're now trying to figure out a way to securely connect it to uh, a website so that other centers can, can do it. You know, there's all kinds of HIPAA rules and all kinds of things we have to, we have to overcome uh, because um, we don't want the Russians coming in and figuring out what we do. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the point is, is that it can be done, but uh, we, we do want to we, we disseminate this uh, information. And, and actually, we do want the Russians to start doing this kind of <laughs> surgery, too. There's a BIV team, and as I said, there's, there's a whole host of in, in individuals here that you would never expect in a, in a, in a medical team, engineers, uh, cardiac imagers, um, anesthesia. We have research folks. The research folks are individuals who have a very different a interest in this. They, have, they, they know a lot about a certain aspect of the disease, and they make a contribution. But you know, they, they, they help us understand the, the broad aspects of the disease. And, and obviously, uh, post-operative care. Uh, these kids undergo very, very complex procedures. The types of problems, complications they're going to have after surgery are, are very different than the kinds of problems we see with kids who have other types of surgeries. So our critical care colleagues need to be aware of it. They need to be anticipating these problems. Um, and so they're uh, an aspect of this. The imaging, uh, as I said, is, uh, is key. This is three-dimensional ultrasound. Um, Jerry Marks, who's in our cardiology team, is one of the world experts in three-dimensional echocardiography. The beauty of echo is that it's not invasive, it's not irradiating. You can just actually put the probe on a child's chest and you see these things. And I can look at this image and I can say, oh, this child has heterotaxy. Why? He's got a common AV valve, he's got an inlet defect, he's got a absence of, of one of the connections to the arteries. That's not too many kids that are going to have that. It's heterotaxy. But the next step is, oh, okay, that valve happens to be sitting over two good-sized ventricles. I know I can divide it. I know I can partition it. And so it helps me plan the operation. Yeah? I'm stuck on the last slide. Okay. What do the engineers do? Because that just threw us off. On the team, you said on the multi multidisciplinary team, there were engineers that were part of the team. Yes. What do they do? So, two Play things. video games. <laughs> well, actually, that is what they do. <laughs> but they do it with cardiac images. So the, the two components, there are engineers who, there, there's two types of engineers that we have, primarily mechanical engineers who understand um, just how things function, how they work. And what they're helping us figure out is how to repair valves. They're really, really good at understanding and applying tools that we don't, computational methods that we don't, we don't you know, I couldn't do math. That's why I went into medicine. No, it, well, it kind of makes sense, though, because of everyone that understood my son's heart defects when we first found out. Mm -hmm. It was my father-in-law, who's a diesel mechanic. Yeah. And he was like, oh, so if you change the flow here, and he's like, but what would the resistance be if you change it to there? Exactly, like, yeah. exactly. So that's what engineers do. They can help us understand flow dynamics as well as geometry. And so Peter Hammer, who is the first engineer that joined us, and actually he leads a team now of individuals, um, that's what he does. And so he, they're able to actually analyze now based on, on, on computational flow dynamics where the blood flow is going to go long before we ever get to the operating room. They can take a 3D MRI image, look at flow dynamics, and predict okay, 40% of the hepatic blood flow is going to go to this lung and 60% is going to go to that lung. And by and large, uh, they're right. So that's where these folks are, have been helpful. We would have never figured that out uh, by the typical surgical trial and error. You know, we tried this, it worked, or we didn't work. We don't know why, but we're not going to do it again. That doesn't work. I mean, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't advance the field at all. These <laughs> folks do. So th that's one group. The other group that's been very, very helpful are the um, um, uh, are, are really uh, specialists in, in image analysis and and and, uh, and in, in, in visualization. So most of the way that these images are acquired, first of all, 
big companies uh, are the ones who typically control uh, the imaging systems. They all have their own proprietary ways of creating the files, the electronic files, that their machine displays to you. But if we want to manipulate those files in order to understand something different, um, then we need someone who understands the code and can get permission from these companies to actually play with it. Um, I can't do that. These are, these are computer programmers uh, and computer programmers who specialize in visualization. That's a whole field now, again, because of the gaming world. In the gaming world, uh, those folks walk on water because they're able to create these things. They understand the code to, to do that. Um, and that's the, that's the other aspect of it. They, they are, we have a whole visualization team that that's what they do. They help us and in, in we have agreements with Philips we have agreements with GE, so they let us get access to their proprietary uh, software so that we can pull those images before they're displayed and actually use them in our own displays. So that, that's, that was, that's why they were helpful. Again, we would never, I mean, I, I, we wouldn't be able to do that. But if we're going to think about these things, if we don't bring these specialists in, uh, then we're never going to learn. We're not, you know, and so building this team to me was the key. Uh, it, and, and it was a huge investment in, in individuals' careers because Peter Hammer could get a job um, working at any startup in, in Silicon Valley, uh, making you know ten times what he's making at an academic center. Um, but this is important for him, so we were able to recruit him, and uh, and he's uh, he's contributing to this program. He's doing many other things uh, in the valve world. But um, this, for, for the heterotaxy program, it was key. Dr. Del Nido, a question was asked, is the BIV team, do they follow these patients long term, much like this single ventricle survivorship program? Yes, that's, okay. that's, uh, that's a big part of it. Good. Yeah, yeah, outcomes. So a follow up on that question is, um, we had a member recently having issues. Um, are biventricle repair kiddos and adults welcome in the single ventricle survivorship program since they were born single ventricle? I'm sorry, what was that again? I didn't. Are the bivents welcome in single ventricle survivorship programs? They should be. I mean, if, not, if for no other reason, to give them a comparator to what's going on in the, you know, the, the issues of single ventricle long-term complications are very unique and, and they're very challenging. Uh, and so we need teams of, of individuals who are going to study that. Um, you know, Jack Rychek is a perfect example at CHOP. You know, he's dedicated to understanding, you know, what are the complications of the Fontan long-term and how do we prevent them or how do we treat them? Very, very important because we have so many kids who are going to have those problems, right? Now, can they, do they have the bandwidth to also follow the BIV? If they do, I think it would be helpful. Um, but at some point, we're going to have to bring the two, you know, the, 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 the two groups together. But right now, our goal is just to get this one off the ground. Uh, but it, it's, it's been two different pathways. Uh, our experience with the single ventricle, at least at our center, was not great with with uh, with heterotaxy, and so we just deviated, and so very rarely do we do single ventricle management um, nowadays in 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 this particular uh, disease problem. How complicated is it determining if a child should go with single ventricle treatment or going into the bivent? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the more complicated decisions. Um, and what we've learned is, is two things. Number one, we need the multidisciplinary team to think about it because we're not thinking, we, we, we have to think not only uh, the operative procedure, can we get them through the operative procedure, but also the long-term outcomes. So. Every child's different. Every child comes with a whole different series of combinations of problems. And so each one kind of needs an individualized uh, solution. Uh, so the team is critical. The other thing that we've learned is that you don't need to go 
all at once into a, a, a two ventricle repair. And in fact, when we started to do that, we had a lot of problems. Uh, and often we, we, we didn't have good results because we just tried to do too much all at once. And what we found is that there is an ideal age, there are things that we can do uh, to get us closer to the two ventricle, making the second procedure uh, much less risky, but still get kids further along, um, and, and push the decision of single ventricle versus two to a later stage where we can assess it um, better. So there's lots and lots of ways that we can get there, um, and, and, but it does require very individualized thinking because every child is a little bit different. They all come with slightly different components of all of these anomalies that can force you to go in one direction or another. You know, if I had a child, just to give you an example, if I have a child who has a um, very complicated biventricular connection that would be very high risk, but I know that he also has primary ciliary dysplasia, I know what the outcome would be if I did a Fontan. It would be horrible. A Fontan will not work in that child. So then we have a difficult discussion. You know, we have to say, do we take this route or that route? Um, but again, every child is different. And so the decision has to be made. You know, it's, it's a discussion. It's a discussion with the teams, the discussion with the parents. And the more the parents understand the issue, the easier it is for them to understand why we're making these recommendations. So. It's not, it's not, it's never, a, a, you know, go one route or another. Uh, very rare. Most of the time, we're really grappling and we're saying, okay, how do we get a little further so we can make a better decision as to what's, but what we're finding is that in most cases, we're able to get kids to two ventricles. So the other, um, the other component uh, is this one, which is uh, valve regurgitation. It's very common, um, and there are varying degrees of valve regurgitation. This is a child who's at dextrocardia, and he has both. Um, you can actually see two jets crossing, one from the right ventricle, one from the left ventricle, so they're kind of crossing this way. And, um, and more importantly, these are the pumping chambers, these are the ventricles. Up here is his atrium. His atrium is massively enlarged because of leak. That child is very susceptible to developing arrhythmias, and that's usually what gets them into trouble, is if the atrium become large enough, they develop arrhythmias, and then that's the final trigger that really gets us into trouble. So we try to intervene long before that. Um, one of the ways that we found that really helps us think about it is the uh, ultrasound, obviously a 3D ultrasound, but also MRI. MRI on the right is, is a, um, gives us a lot of more information than we can get from uh, ultrasound. The downside of MRI is you need, usually you need an anesthesia or you need a sedation in order to get these kinds of images. But if we really need to make a, 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 a difficult decision, Getting that information is critical, so we're worth it's worth it to 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 to, to have you know take the risk of another anesthetic and figure out what's going on here. We see that this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. They're roughly equal size. This black here is the equivalent of the jets here in MRI. Regurgitant jets uh, look black. That's the leak. We can see the location. We can see that there's actually a pretty good valve here. Most of the leak in this child happens to be from the left ventricle. We can zero in on what the problem is and then plan the, uh, plan the procedure. And then the other component is, okay, we've got only one outlet in this child. Um, that outlet happens to be an aorta up here. The left ventricle is the ventricle that's over here on the right side. So somehow we've got to get the blood from here through this hole out to the aorta, which is up here. Planning that is a three-dimensional problem. And this, again, is where the three-dimensional imaging and three-dimensional display makes a difference. Uh, there are structures in the way. It looks like this muscle bundle is in the way. Is that something we can remove? That's one of the questions uh, that we'd like to answer before we ever get into the operating room. Most of the time that's true, but sometimes that's not the case. It's, 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 a, it's a critical structure supporting a valve. It's a critical structure carrying conduction tissue. We've got to figure out another way to do it. Um, and so the, the, the figuring out the steps and all of all of the different components that we have to repair 
um, is, is part of the challenge here. So the goal, though, for the biventricular repair is to partition that large valve into two sides, partition this large atrium into two sides, uh, create a clear pathway, in this case, between the left ventricle and the aorta, which is coming off the right ventricle, uh, create that pathway so that there's no obstruction. Um, and in this case, a new connection between the right ventricle and the lungs. Um, and then the timing. How do we do it? Do we do it in one stage? Do we do it in two, potentially three? Uh, what's the best way to do it? That, those are the decisions that are made. Since the program started, um, we've reviewed, or the program has reviewed 266 children. This is as of um, uh, early, earlier this spring. So you can see the, uh, it, the, the BIV program covers not just heterotaxy. Heterotaxies are this group, as you can see it's a majority, but we also look at hypoplastic left heart syndrome, kids with other just small structures, uh, whether it's a small left ventricle or small right ventricle. Again, trying to figure out ways to get them to, uh, to a two ventricle repair. Very different. This group is very, very different than, than this group. This tends to be more of a chamber size, ventricle size. This group is complexity, multiple problems. Sorry, oh, okay, I can see my pointer. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to do that on this then. There we go, okay. See, I learned something from the computer guys. Um, this is the heterotaxy group, this these three. Um, the, this other group is the uh, non-heterotaxy small chambers. So one side, in this case here, it's the small right ventricle, this case is small left ventricle, and this is a combination of problems. Um, the issues for these kids is how do we get that chamber to grow so that it's adequate size to be able to support the circulation. Um, in kids in this, most of the time those ventricles are already fully grown. So we don't have to worry too much about that. What we do have to worry about is how do we partition them, how do we get the connections properly done uh, in the sequence of steps. So it's the same goal, the way we get there is very different. Inducing chamber growth was actually something that we kind of discovered uh, by the fetal interventions. Um, and, and this was a very different disease, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, when we saw that at, at about 20 weeks gestation, um, these kids were already developing problems with the left side of the heart, and you could detect it by ultrasound. You could see that one of their valves, the outlet valve on the left side, wasn't opening well. And so a group got together and said, well, can we using our catheter techniques, can we open up that valve? Um, and what impact will it have? What they knew already was that if that valve closed, that ventricle stopped growing, the other chamber kept growing uh, in the fetus, and you'd end up with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So well, their question was, can, if they open up that valve, can we get that ventricle to continue to grow? And so that was undertaken, and in fact, they found that you could. It doesn't, there's a window of time when you can do it, uh, typically between 20 and 23 weeks gestation. Uh, even there, not all the kids respond, but at least it proved the principle that uh, they have the capability of growing. In other words, just because the ventricle is small size doesn't mean it has to stay that way. That if you get more blood flow into it, it actually responds. So that's, that's um, was an important finding for us because then we could start to treat many other problems where one chamber uh, hasn't grown appropriately. And so it impacted this so-called unbalanced canal defects, and it definitely imp impacted some forms of the heterotaxy syndrome, where many kids are sent down the single ventricle pathway because one chamber is a little bit smaller than the other. And we said, no, no, that, that we, can, we can get those to even out pretty well by interventions that we can do as, a, as an initial stage. Once they're e even in size, then we can go to the biventricular repair. So we started a paradigm uh, where certain ventricles we thought were way too small for us to uh, even consider, um, and it had to do with size. This 15 mL per meter squared is was sort of the category that we used. There was a borderline group where we knew we had to grow that ventricle, and then there are the kids where the ventricles were of adequate size, um, and we could go directly to a biventricular. So these kids were staged. Um, these kids we still manage, 
mostly with single ventricle um, because we haven't, you know, when we have attempted to recruit the left ventricle, we haven't had great success. And so we've stopped and we said, well, you know, we don't have enough knowledge yet to figure out how to get those uh, really tiny chambers to grow. Uh, maybe it's a timing issue. Maybe we should be doing the intervention in the fetus rather than after birth. Um, and so there are, there are other things that we need to do, but in the meantime, we know that at least single ventricle management offers them some, um, uh, some you know, reasonable long-term outcome. And so that's how we make decisions. Yeah. I am a little bit curious um, when you are recruiting ventricles or um, choosing to go the bivent route um, with just a slightly smaller ventricle um, or whatever, um, when you're manipulating a ventricle in that sense, um, are there, do you know or do you predict that there may be any long-term risks to manipulating what the heart naturally developed? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, it's interesting, I, you know, when you start looking at this, um, you begin to discover there have been people that have been studying this problem in obscurity, um, but have a lot of interesting information to 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 uh, you know to help you. So there is um, a um, an, in, an in individual who's an engineer actually um, by the name of Lewis Tabor, who working at Washington University in the engineering department, and his whole interest was how do blood vessels in fetuses develop, what actually makes a blood vessel develop. You know, if you think about it, a fetus is growing. All the blood vessels in their body are growing appropriately to their body size. How does that happen? You know, how do, how do we get a blood vessel to grow, you know, this size, not this size, or not grow at all? And what he discovered is that it has to do with fluid forces. In other words, it's, it's the blood flow. It's the blood flow and the pressure of that blood flow pushing up against the wall, which makes it grow. So what he demonstrated was that's a natural process that occurs. And what we're seeing is where an unnatural deviation from that process occurred. And so the question that we had was, okay, if it's the blood flow, what, what is it about the blood flow that's changing? In the hypoplastic left heart, it was an easy answer, it was the valve. If the valve closes, there's no blood flow. And so why should the ventricle grow? So we, we knew that it, was a, it, it, it had to do with a, a normal physiologic response to this physical force. And so we started to devise ways of saying, well, what if we forced more blood flow by diverting uh, blood into that one chamber, will it respond? And you know, we've been doing that for about 15 years. So we've got enough experience now to know when it works and when it doesn't. And we've got kids that we're following long term that have been out now 15 years with these manipulations. And we know that it works long term. So we've learned what the cutoff is, you know, when, when you're taking too much of a risk, when you're not. Um, and, but it was based really on that fundamental work that Tabor did um, back in the, in the 80s. Um, and again, published in obscurity, but really has, it was a revelation to us. It's obvious when you think about it, but until he showed it, we didn't think about it. But that, that I think we were just basically taking advantage of Mother Nature saying, okay, blood flow is the key. If we get more blood flow to it, things will happen. It'll change appropriately. And most of the time that worked. It was as simple as that. Um, I'll just, I'm just gonna, I'm almost finished here, but this is basically, this is another subgroup of the BIVs. These are the kids with complex transpositions and double outlet right ventricles, what we've looked at uh, and looked at their results. And again, most of those kids have been able to go to a biventricular repair. Um, and the midterm results, that we call them midterm because we don't, we don't have long term. And by that I mean more, you know, having the majority of our kids out more than 10 years. But the midterm results are, are, are pretty good. If you remember the curves that we saw before with heterotaxy, um, you know, most of them, even, even the, the polysplenics were up here in around 75 to 80% range, but the asplenics were way down here. So this includes both. Uh, 
uh, both groups. Um, and, and so far, the results are encouraging. The numbers out here are pretty small. If you, I don't know if you can read these numbers, but you know we've got 27 out here. Uh, whereas over here, we've got a total of about 240 uh, where we start. Um, we just don't have kids that are out far enough. Um, so we continue to study them, we continue to follow them, we're very, very interested in, in seeing how they do, um, and it certainly makes a difference. Now, do they need interventions? Yes. They need additional interventions, and, and this is things like if, it, if they didn't have a connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries, we put a conduit in when they were little, they come back because they've outgrown that conduit, we have to change it. Those are the kinds of re-interventions that we're talking about here. Um, Majority will need some at some point. This is out 10 years. The majority will need some of those. But those are operations that are much lower risk, much less complex. And even there, catheter techniques for flattening that curve and getting our results better long term are really making a difference. The ability to put a valve via a catheter um, wasn't available 10 years ago. Uh, it was experimental. Now it's routine. Uh, very rarely do we go in surgically to put in a new valve on the right side of the heart. It's done by, by catheters. The only time we do it is when the actual artery, the actual conduit, hasn't grown, and it's too small, and that we have to change. So things continue to evolve. Um, this is our overall experience, uh, and I, you know, this, it's the same with the unbalanced canal defect. So I'll summarize there um, things that you already know. Heterotaxy syndrome is rare. It's a very complex series of defects. It's more than just a cardiac um, a problem. It's as non-cardiac manifestations. Sometimes those cardiac manifestations uh, have a huge impact on the overall outcome, and, and primarily the, the, the ciliary dysfunctions, and particularly in the lung or the GI tract, uh, have, have a, a particularly uh, important impact. Um, these defects are multiple in the heart, and so if you're going to repair them, you've got to be pretty comfortable dealing with all of the components. Uh, the valves, the, the baffles, all of those things, you have to be pretty comfortable in doing them. Uh, and so that's where we thought a group together that that's what they think about and that's what they do uh, makes a difference. And so the, 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 the specialized team uh, is, uh, you know, for us was the key to making this uh, a, a successful endeavor. So I'll stop there if you have any other, any other questions. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how many patients that you took from uh, Glenn and then went by vent or Fontan and then went by vent. Yeah, yeah, well, big difference. So most of our kids have had a Glenn of some sort. So we call them a IV conversion because initially they were going down the single ventricle pathway. They had a Glenn, uh, but taking down the Glenn usually is fairly straightforward. And our results with that have been very good. And, and, and in fact, sometimes, even as part of a staging procedure for some of the heterotaxy children, we'll do a Glenn just to improve oxygenation before the two ventricle. The Fontan, however, is a very different story. Uh, because there, often, we are only doing it when the Fontan is failing. And, and, and when the Fontan fails, that impacts a lot of other organs, the liver, kidneys, and so forth and so on. So, we do it. We have a fairly, um, I would say, fairly big experience now for a whole host of different indications, not just heterotaxy. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging group of patients. They, they are, you know, it, it, and it's all about age. Um, how long they've had the Fontan physiology makes a difference. If they've had it for a decade or less, usually we've been able to do it without too much problem. When you get into their second or third decade, they have liver disease, they have cirrhosis, they have other problems, and, and we're going to impose this huge operation on top of all that. It, it just, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's a really challenging problem. So the Fontans I, I look at separately, and that group uh, for us is still a, a, um, a work in progress. And then I had one other question. In our dream society, we would all be able to take our children to Boston and have this done. Um, but the reality is, is not all of our insurances cover um, mm -hmm. our, our patients at, in Boston. So um, 
I know you guys all work as a team, so I don't feel like I'm going to be taking, you know, uh, work <laughs> from you guys or taking patients from you, but can you speak of any other um, institutions that you feel have also created um, a very similar approach with their single ventricles um, and heterotaxy patients, actually, um, <laughs> that you feel would also be good or, or good institutions to consider sending our kids to? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me, let me address the insurance issue because um, that's a very important one. You know, the, 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 the way that the insurance processes work is, is primarily to, uh, to address the more common problems. And, and for that, it's important that, you know, this is how the, the business world works, is they have to make ends meet. And if, and if everybody goes wherever, uh, they, they can't, the insurance companies can't, uh, can't survive. Almost every insurer, and includes virtually, every, you know, we deal with every Medicaid system in the entire country, including now Alaska. I'm certified in Medicaid in Alaska. We had a heterotaxi patient who we just operated on who was off an island off of Alaska on the Bering Sea. So we deal, <laughs> we deal with it. Right, we deal with it. If you get down to the individuals, you know, to the medical officers within those, uh, you know, those organizations, within the payers, and you explain to them the problem, they will usually, you know, they will usually work with you. So never take a single response at face value because it's, it's the standard response. And so we work with virtually everybody and, and um, you know, we, we, we explain to them what it is that's different we show them our results, and by and large, we rarely had a, a, you know, someone absolutely, absolutely denied. Uh, it can take a long time, though, and that's the, that's the challenge. And so if, if the child is really unstable and not doing well, we may not have enough time. So that's number one. And I, and I think you know, parent groups have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. We can, as physicians, we can scream until we're red in the face. The insurers will ignore us. But if parents um, uh, say something, uh, they pay attention. So it, it, it's, it's your groups are actually key uh, to this. The other aspect is, is if we only did it in Boston, this wouldn't go anywhere. You know, it, it, it's not going to be a solution. So part of what we're trying to do, and this is, this is part of the mission of the BIV program, is to set up sort of standard operating procedures. You know, this is how you ought to think about this disease. These operations, by and large, are not operations that uh, that can't be done in other centers. No, they absolutely can be done in other. But you need a dedicated team to, that's going to be thinking about it and, and, and working at it in order to get the good results. And so I are those propping up? Yeah. I think LA Children's is one example with Ron Starnes, um, a group in Columbia, in New York is, is, is beginning to do these. I mean, it's, they're, they're all beginning to think about it and beginning to collect the group. So. I think in another five years, ten years, there's going to be a whole lot of these programs. Uh, and we'll have more standardized ways. We're still kind of making it up as we go along for some of these more challenging problems. Okay. So, unfortunately, some of our children are so complex they've been deemed by you and Imani that they cannot do a biventricle repair. Our children are getting older. Sorry. For these single vents where their fontan is doing great, but their livers are failing. What do you recommend for children like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a that's that's a huge Sorry. issue. No, no, no. I, I think we all understand. It's a it's a huge issue. I mean, this is why I think the the work that Jack Rychek is doing at CHOP uh, is so important, because he's he's trying to figure out ways to um, you know to address these problems. The more we understand about why the cirrhosis develops in the Fontan, why the pulmonary venous hypertension occurs. There's clearly an inflammatory process that, that contributes. It's not just the high venous pressures, there's an inflammatory process. We're learning a lot. You know, 10 years ago when we looked at heterotaxy, 
we didn't know, we didn't have a clue as to what we were doing. Ten years down the road, we still have a lot of unanswered questions, but we know a lot. This is where we are with the failing Fontan. So we don't, we, you know, we, we deal with it at our place. We don't have a dedicated team to deal with failing Fontan the way that, you know, that Philadelphia has. Um, will we have to develop one? I think so, because it's going to be a growing problem. Um, but I think that there is, there is an interest in figuring out what to do, and there are groups that are actually working on that. Um, you know, it, it, the challenges are different. You know, we took a different road, which is to say, okay, let's just avoid that pathway. Let's figure out a way to, to just avoid it. It works in a significant percentage, but in some it doesn't. And so uh, we, you know, we, we kind of said, okay, in that situation, we'll just have to do the single ventricle. Um, but um, as new knowledge comes on board, um, then we have to incorporate it. And, and that's one of the things that, um, that we, we're going to have to start thinking about. Um, and actually, we've had some inquiries from, from uh, in interestingly enough, it's engineering groups um, from MIT who have an interest in single ventricle physiology. And they, they're think, they think about it like engineers, you know, what can we mechanically do to improve the Fontan physiology? Um, and, um, you know, they, they have a very different approach, and uh, in my view, that's the way it's, that, that's where the answers lie. It's, it's not doing the same thing we've done every day. It's doing something completely different and making that work um, that, that's going to give us some answers. So there are groups that are working on this. Um, it's early still, um, but we have some time. You know, for some kids we don't, but I, we still have some time, and I, and I have faith that we will come up with better solutions to this. Um, so uh, I'm just going to out myself. I, uh, Dr. Del Nudo, I have to thank you, um, by the way. Um, f I attended your conference at Cleveland Clinic, the, uh, or, or your talk, and the Cleveland Clinic on heterotaxy. Um, I get to dip my feet in both worlds. Um, I, I'm a doctor. I have a son with heterotaxy. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess one thing that I, I just wanted to share with you at present is, first of all, thank you so much. Um, so meaningful to know that heterotaxy was your talk at the at the complex cardiac surgery meeting, and um, and you know just to just to be a mom um, who you know it's this I I've known about it I've taken care of patients I've learned about it but then to actually have one that was so meaningful um, and it's so meaningful to. To I mean I think for all of the doctors to hear to um, this it, you know I know it's 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 so complex or so little but I feel like even just in the last three years there's been an explosion of um, of research and I'm we're, I and every parent in here is so grateful for that um, I think it's it's just also um, I I wanted all of you guys to know because I don't know if you guys knew that that there's a lot of um, uh, I mean, cardiac cardiac surgeons really want to tackle this, and that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think other for you too. There, Atlanta has a has a, a group every two years specifically on the failures of Fontan, right? And I went to that meeting as well. And it, I think it's really opened my eyes to this whole other world and to be able to see both. Um, but I think it's I I really just had to say it to you in person. Dr. Del Nudo, thank you so much for just you know opening this up. D it, after reading study after study, we didn't include the heterotaxy patients, right? Mm -hmm. It was so discouraging. Um, and now to see that you guys are and that there is, you know, there's hope for, for our kids that are younger and our kids that are older. Um, we know, we know that you know in some cases there, you know, we have to we have to accept that it's reality, but just knowing that there are people out there, that there are engineers out there that are even working on this is really so, we're just so grateful, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you.